Chapter 10, Part 2 of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 10, Horseshoes, Part 2. The first game was on our grounds, and Connie gave us a talking to in the clubhouse beforehand. The shorter this serious is, he says, the better for us. If it's a long serious, we're going to have trouble, because McGraw's got five pitchers he can work, and we've got about three. So I want you boys to go at em from the jump and play em off their feet. Don't take things easy, because it ain't going to be no snap. Just because we've licked him before ain't no sign we'll do it this time. Then he calls me to one side and asks me what I knowed about Parker. You was with the clubs when he was, wasn't you, he says. Yes, I says, and he's the luckiest stiff you ever seen. If he got stewed and fell in the gutter, he'd catch a fish. I don't like to hear a good ball player call lucky, says Connie. He must have a lot of ability or McGraw wouldn't use him regular. And he's been hitting about 340 and played a bang-up game at third base. That can't be all luck. Wait till you see him, I says, and if you don't say he's the luckiest guy in the world, you can sell me to the Boston Bloomer Girls. He's so lucky, I says, that if they traded him to the St. Louis Browns, they'd have the pennant cinched by the 4th of July. And I'll bet Connie was willing to agree with me before it was over. Well... The chief worked against the big rube in that game. We beat him, but they give us a battle, and it was Parker that made it close. We'd gone along nothing and nothing till the seventh, and then rube walks Collins and Baker lifts one over that little old wall. You'd think by this time, them New York pitchers would know better than to give that guy anything he can hit. In their part of the ninth, the chief still had him shut out and two down, and the crowd was going home. But Doyle gets hit in the sleeve with a pitch ball and it speeds turn. He hits a foul pretty near straight up, but Shang misjudges it. Then he lifts another one and this time McInnes drops it. He'd ought to have been out twice. The chief tries to make him hit at a bad one then, because he'd got him two strikes and nothing. He hit at it all right, kissed it for three bases between Strunk and Joyce. And it was a wild pitch that he hit. Doyle scores, of course, and the bugs suddenly decide not to go home just yet. I fully expected to see him steal home and get away with it, but Murray cut into the first ball and lined out to Barry. Plank beat Maddie 2-1 to one the next day in New York, and again Speed and his rabbit's foot give us an awful argument. Maddie wasn't so good as usual, and we really ought to have beat him bad. Two different times, Strunk was on and second waiting for any kind of wallop, and both times Barry cracked him down the third base line like a shot. Speed stopped the first one with his stomach and extricated the pill just in time to nail Barry at first base and retire the side. The next time, he throwed his glove in front of his face in self-defense, and the ball stuck in it. In the sixth inning, Shang was on third base and Plank on first and two down and Murphy combed an awful one to Speed's left. He didn't have time to stoop over and he just stuck out his foot. Ball hit it and caromed in two hops right into Doyle's hands on second base before Plank got there. Then in the seventh, Speed bunts one and Baker trips and falls going after it or he'd have threw him out a mile. They was two gone. So Speed steals second, and of course Shang has to make a bad peg right at that time and lets him go to third. Then Collins boots one on Murray, and they've got a run. But it didn't do him no good because Collins and Baker and McInnes come up in the ninth and walloped them where Parker couldn't reach them. Coming back to Philly on the train that night, I says to Connie, What do you think of that Parker bird now? He's lucky, all right, says Connie, smiling, but we won't hold it against him if he don't beat us with it. It ain't too late, I says. He ain't pulled his real stuff yet. The whole bunch was talking about him and his luck and saying it was about time for things to break against him. I warned him that there wasn't no chance, that it was permanent with him. 
Bush and Tezro hooked up next day, and neither of them had much stuff. Everybody was hitting, and it looked like anybody's game right up to the ninth. Speed had got on every time he'd come up, the wind blowing his fly balls away from the outfielders and the infielders booting when he hit them on the ground. When the ninth started, the score was seven apiece. Connie and McGraw both had their whole pitching staffs warming up. The crowd was wild because they'd been all kinds of action. There wasn't no danger of anybody's leaving their seats before this game was over. Well, Besher is walked to start with, and Connie's about ready to give Bush the hook. But Doyle pops out trying to bunt. Then Speed gets two strikes and two balls, and it looked to me like the next one was right over the heart. But Connolly calls it a ball and gives him another chance. He wails the groove ball to the fence in left center and gets round to third on it while Besher scores. Right then, Bush comes out and the chief goes in. He whiffs Murray and has two strikes on Merkel when Speed makes a break for home. And, of course, that was the one ball Shang dropped in the whole series. They had a two-run lead on us then, and it looked like a cinch for them to hold it, because the minute Tezro showed a sign of weakening, McGraw was sure to holler for Maddie or the Rube. But you know how quick that bunch of iron can make a two-run lead look sick. Before McGraw could get Jeff out of there, we had two on the bases. Then Rube comes in and fills him up by walking Joyce. It was Eddie's turn to wallop, and if he didn't do nothing, we had Baker coming up next. This time, Counton saved Baker the trouble and wanged one clear to the woods. Everybody scored but him, and he could have too, if it had been necessary. In the clubhouse, the boys naturally felt pretty good. We'd cop three in a row, and it looked like we'd make it four straight because we had the chief to send back at him the following day. Your friend Parker is lucky, the boy says to me, but it don't look like he could stop us now. I felt the same way and was consulting the timetables to see whether I could get a train out of New York for the West next evening. But do you think Speed's luck was ready to quit? Not yet. And it's a wonder we didn't all go nuts during the next few days. If words could kill, Speed would have died a thousand times. And I wish he had. They wasn't no record-breaking crowd out when we got to the polo grounds. I guess the New York Bugs was pretty well discouraged and the betting was 8-5 to five that we'd cop that battle and finish it. The Chief was the only guy that warmed up for us and McGraw didn't have no choice but to use Matty, with the whole thing dependent on this game. They went along like the two swell pitchers they was till Speed's in, and, which in this battle was the 8th. Nobody scored, and it didn't look like they was ever going to till Murphy starts off that round with a perfect bunt, and Joyce sacrifices him to second. All Maddie had to do then was to get rid of Collins and Baker, and that's about as easy as selling silk socks to an Eskimo. He didn't give Eddie nothing he wanted to hit, though, and finally he slaps one on the ground to Doyle. Larry made the play to first base and Murphy moved to third. We all figured Maddie'd walk Baker then, and he done it. Connie sends Baker down to second on the first pitch to McInnes, but Myers don't pay no attention to him. They was playing for McInnes and wasn't taking no chances of throwing the ball away. Well, the count goes to three and two on McInnes, and Maddie comes with a curve. He's got some curve, too. But Jack happened to meet it and blooey down the left foul line where he always hits. I never seen a ball hit so hard in my life. No infielder in the world could have stopped it. But I'll give you a thousand bucks if that ball didn't go kerplunk right into the third bag and stop as dead as George Washington. It was child's play for Speed to pick it up and heave it over to Merkel before Jack got there. If anybody else had been playing third base, the bag would have ducked out of the way of that wallop, but even the bases themselves was helping him out. The two runs we ought to have had on Jack's smash would have been just enough to beat them, because they got the only run of the game in their half, or I should say, the Lord gave it to them.
Doyle'd been throwed out and up come Parker, smiling. The minute I seen him smile, I felt like something was coming off, and I made the remark on the bench. Well, the chief pitched one right at him, and he tried to duck. The ball hit his bat and went on a line between Jack and Eddie. Speed didn't know he'd hit it till the guys on the bench wised him up. Then he just had time to get to first base. They tried the hit and run on the second ball, and Murray lifts a high fly that Murphy didn't have to move for. Collins pulled the old bluff about the ball being on the ground, and Barry yells, Go on, go on, like he was the coacher. Speed fell for it and didn't know where the ball was, no more than a rabbit. He just run his fool head off, and we was getting all ready to laugh when the ball comes down and Murphy dropped it. If Parker had stuck near first base like he ought to have done, he wouldn't have gotten no farther in second. But with the start he got, he was pretty near third when Murphy made the muff, and it was a cinch for him to score. The next two guys was easy outs, so they wouldn't have had a run except for Speed's boner. We couldn't do nothing in the ninth, and we was licked. Well, that was a tough one to lose, but we figured that Maddie was through, and we'd wind it up the next day as we had Plank ready to send back at him. We wasn't afraid of the Rube, because he hadn't never bothered Collins and Baker much. The two left-handers come together just like everybody doped it, and it was about even up to the eighth. Plank had been going great, and though the score was two and two, they'd got their two on boots, and we'd hit Arn in. We went after Rube in our part of the eighth and knocked him out. Damari stopped us after we'd scored two more. It's all over but the shouting, says Davis on the bench. Yes, I says, unless that seventh son of a seventh son gets up there again. He did. And he come up after they'd filled the bases with a boot, a base hit, and a walk with two out. I says to Davis, if I was Plank, I'd pass him and give him one run. That wouldn't be no baseball, says Davis. Not with Murray coming up. Well, it mayn't have been no baseball, but it couldn't have turned out worse if they did it that way. Speed took a healthy at the first ball, but it was a hook and he caught it on the handle right up near his hands. It started outside the first base line like a follow and then changed its mind and rolled in. Shang run away from the plate because it looked like it was up to him to make the play. He picked the ball up and had to make the peg in a hurry. His throw hit speed right on top of the head and bounded off like it had struck a cement sidewalk. It went clear over to the seats and before McInnes could get it, three guys had scored and speed was on third base. He was left there, but that didn't make no difference. We was licked again, and for the first time the gang really begun to get scared. We went over to New York Sunday afternoon and we didn't do no singing on the way. Some of the fellers tried to laugh, but it hurt them. Connie sent us to bed early, but I don't believe none of the bunch got much sleep. I know I didn't. I was worrying too much about the serious and also about the girl who hadn't sent me no telegram like I'd asked her to. Monday morning, I wired her asking what was the matter and telling her I was getting tired of her foolishness. Of course, I didn't make it so strong as that, but the telegram cost me a dollar and forty cents. Connie had the choice of two pitchers for the sixth game. He could use Bush, who'd been slammed around pretty hard last time out, or the chief, who'd only had two days rest. The rest of them, outside of Plank, had an epidemic of sore arms. Connie finally picked Bush so he could have the chief in reserve in case we had to play a seventh game. McGraw started Big Jeff, and we went at it. It wasn't like the last time these two guys had hooked up. This time they both had something, and for eight innings, runs was as scarce as Chinese policemen. They'd been chances to score on both sides, but the big guy in Bush was both tight in the pinches. The crowd was plum nuts and yelled like Indians every time a fly ball was caught or a strike called. They'd have got their money's worth if they hadn't been no ninth, but believe me, that was some round. They was one out when Barry hit one through the box for a base. Shang walked and it was Bush's turn. Connie told him to bunt, but he whiffed in the attempt. Then Murphy comes up and walks, and the bases are choked. 
Young Joyce had been pie for Tesro all day, or else McGraw might have changed pitchers right there. Anyway, he left Big Jeff in, and he beaned Joyce with a fast one. It sounded like a tire blowing out. Joyce falls over in a heap, and we chase out there thinking he's dead. But he ain't. And pretty soon he gets up and walks down to first base. Tesro had forced in a run, and again we begun to count the winner's end. Maddie comes in to prevent further damage, and Collins flies the side out. Hold him now, work hard, we says to young Bush, and he walks out there just as cool as though he was going to hit fungos. McGraw sends up a pinch hitter for Maddie, and Bush whiffed him. Then Besher flied out. I was praying that Doyle would end it because Speed's turn come up after his, and so I pretty near fell dead when Larry hit safe. Speed had his old smile and even more chest than usual when he come up there swinging five or six bats. He didn't wait for Doyle to try and steal or nothing. He lit into the first ball, though Bush was trying to waste it. I seen the ball go high in the air toward left field, and then I picked up my glove and got ready to beat it for the gate. But when I looked out to see if Joyce was set, what do you think I seen? He was lying flat on the ground. That blow on the head had got him just as Bush was pitching to speed. He'd flopped over and didn't no more know what was going on than if he'd croaked. Well, everybody else seen it at the same time, but it was too late. Strunk made a run for the ball, but there wasn't no chance for him to get near it. It hit the ground about ten feet back of where Joyce was lying and bounded way over to the end of the foul line. You don't have to be told that Doyle and Parker both scored and the Sirius was tied up. We carried Joyce to the clubhouse, and after a while he'd come to. He cried when he found out what had happened. We cheered him up all we could, but he was a pretty sick guy. The trainer said he'd be all right, though, for the final game. They tossed up a coin to see where they'd play the seventh battle, and our club won the toss. So we went back to Philly that night and cussed Parker clear across New Jersey. I was so sore I kicked the stuffing out of my seat. You probably heard about the excitement in the Berg yesterday morning. The demand for tickets was something fierce, and some of them sold for as high as 25 bucks apiece. Our club hadn't been looking for no seventh game, and they was some tall hustling done round that old ballpark. I started out to the grounds early and bought some New York papers to read on the car. There was a big story that Speed Parker, the Giants' hero, was going to be married a week after the end of the series. It didn't give the name of the girl saying Speed had refused to tell it. I figured she must be some dame he'd met round the circuit somewheres. There was another story by one of them smart baseball reporters saying that Parker, on his way up to the plate, had saw that Joyce was about ready to faint and had hit the fly ball to left field on purpose. Can you beat it? I was going to show that to the boys in the clubhouse, but the minute I blowed in there, I got some news that made me forget about everything else. Joyce was very sick, and they took him to a hospital. It was up to me to play. Connie come over and asked me whether I'd ever hit against Maddie. I told him I hadn't, but I'd saw enough of him to know he wasn't no worse than Johnson. He told me he was going to let me hit second, in Joyce's place, because he didn't want to bust up the rest of his combination. He also told me to take my orders from Strunk about where to play for the batters. Where shall I play for Parker, I says, trying to joke and pretend I wasn't scared to death. I wished I could tell you, says Connie. I guess the only thing to do when he comes up is to get down on your knees and pray. The rest of the bunch slapped me on the back and gave me all the encouragement they could. The place was jammed when we went out on the field. They may have even been bigger crowds before, but they never was packed together so tight. I doubt whether there was even room enough left for Falkenberg to sit down. The afternoon papers had printed the stuff about Joyce being out of it, so the bugs was wise that I was going to play. They watched me pretty close in batting practice and give me a hand whenever I managed to hit one hard. When I was out catching fungos, the guys in the bleachers cheered me and told me they was with me, but I don't mind telling you that I was as nervous as a bride. There wasn't no need for the announcers to tip the crowd off to the pitchers. Everybody in the United States and Cuba knowed that the chief had worked for us and Maddie for them. 
The chief didn't have no trouble with him in the first inning. Even from where I stood, I could see that he had a lot of stuff. Besher and Doyle popped out and speed whiffed. Well, I started out making good with reverse English in our part. Fletcher booted Murphy's ground ball and I was sent up to sacrifice. I'd done a complete job of it, sacrificing not only myself, but Murphy with a pop fly that Maddie didn't have to move for. That spoiled whatever chance we had of getting the jump on him, but the boys didn't ball me for it. That's all right, old boy. You're all right, they said on the bench. If they'd had a gun, they'd have shot me. I didn't drop no fly balls in the first six innings because none was hit out my way. The chief was so good that they wasn't hitting nothing out of the infield. And we wasn't doing nothing with Maddie either. I led off in the fourth and fouled the first one. I didn't molest the other two, but if Connie and the gang talked about me, they'd done it internally. I come up again with Murphy on third base and two gone in the sixth and done my little whiffing specialty. And still the only people that panned me was the 30000 that had paid for the privilege. My first fielding chance come in the seventh. You'd have thought that I'd have had my nerve back by that time. But I was just as scared as though I'd never saw a crowd before. It was just as well that they was two out when Merkel hit one to me. I staggered under it and finally it hit me on the shoulder. Merkel got to second but the chief whiffed the next guy. I was gave some cross looks on the bench, and I shouldn't have blamed the fellers if they'd cut loose with some language, but they didn't. There's no use in me telling you about none of the rest of it except what happened just before the start of the 11th and during that inning, which was sure the big one of yesterday's pastime, both for speed and yours sincerely. The scoreboard was still a row of ciphers, and speed had had only a fair amount of luck. He made a scratch base hit and robbed our bunch of a couple of real ones with impossible stops. When Shang flied out and wound up our tenth, I was leaning against the end of our bench. I heard my name spoke, and I turned around and seen a boy at the door. Right here, I says, and he gave me a telegram. Better not open it till after the game, says Connie. Oh no, it ain't no bad news, I said, for I figured it was an answer from the girl. So I opened it up and read it on the way to my position. It said, Forgive me, Dick, and forgive Speed, too. Letter follows. Well, sir, I ain't no baby, but for a minute I just wanted to sit down and bawl. And then all of a sudden I got so mad I couldn't see. I run right into Baker as he was picking up his glove. Then I give him a shove and called him some name, and him and Barry both looked at me like I was crazy. And I was. When I got out in left field, I stepped on my own foot and spiked it. I just had to hurt somebody. As I remember it, the chief fanned the first two of them. Then Doyle catches one just right and lambs it up against the fence back of Murphy. The ball caromed around some, and Doyle got all the way up to third base. Next thing I seen was Speed strutting up to the plate. I run clear in from my position. Kill him, I says to the chief. Hit him in the head and kill him, and I'll go to jail for it. Are you off your nuts, says the chief. Go out there and play ball and quit raving. Barry and Baker led me away and give me a shove out toward left. Then I heard the crack of the bat and I seen the ball come in a mile a minute. It was headed between Strunk and I and looked like it would go out of the park. I don't remember running nor nothing about it till I run into the concrete wall head first. They told me afterward, and all the papers said that it was the greatest catch ever seen, and I never knowed I'd caught the ball. Some of the managers have said my head was pretty hard, but it wasn't as hard as that concrete. I was pretty near out, but they tell me I walked to the bench like I wasn't hurt at all. They also tell me that the crowd was a bunch of raven maniacs and was throwing money at me. I guess the groundkeeper will get it. The boys on the bench was all talking at once and slapping me on the back, but I didn't know what it was about. Somebody told me pretty soon that it was my turn to hit, and I picked up the first bat I come to and starts for the plate. McInnes come running after me and asked me whether I didn't want my own bat. I cussed him and told him to mind his own business. I didn't know it at the time, but I found out afterward that they was two out. The bases was empty. I tell you just what I had in my mind. I wasn't thinking about the ball game. 
I was determined that I was going to get to third base and give that guy my spikes. If I didn't hit one worth three bases, or if I didn't hit one at all, I was going to run till I got round to where speed was and then slide into him and cut him to pieces. Right now, I can't tell you whether I hit a fastball or a slow ball or a hook or a fader, but I hit something. It went over Besher's head like a shot and then took a crazy bound. It must have struck a rock or a pop bottle because it hopped clear over the fence and landed in the bleachers. Mind you, I learned this afterward. At the time, I just knowed I'd hit one somewheres, and I starts round the bases. I speeded up when I got near third and took a running jump at a guy I thought was Parker. I missed him and sprawled all over the bag. Then all of a sudden, I come to my senses. All the athletics was out there to run home with me, and it was one of them I'd tried to cut. Speed had left the field. The boys picked me up and seen to it that I went on and touched the plate. Then I was carried into the clubhouse by the crazy bugs. Well, they had a celebration in there, and it was a long time before I got a chance to change my clothes. The boys made a big fuss over me. They told me they'd intended to give me 500 bucks for my divvy, and now I was going to get a full share. Parker ain't the only lucky guy, says one of them. But even if that ball hadn't have took that crazy hop, you'd have had a triple. A triple. That's just what I'd wanted, and he called me lucky for not getting it. The Giants was dressing in the other part of the clubhouse, and when I finally come out there, it was speed, standing waiting for some of the others. He seen me come in and he smiled. Hello, horseshoes, he says. He won't smile no more for a while. It'll hurt too much. And if any girl wants him when she sees him now with his nose over shaking hands with his ear and his jaw a couple of feet foul, she's welcome to him. They won't be no contest. Grimes leaned over to ring for the waiter. Well, he said, what about it? You won't have to pay my fare, I told him. I'll buy a drink anyway, he said. You've been a good listener, and I had to get it off my chest. Maybe they'll have to postpone the wedding, I said. No, said Grimes. The wedding will take place the day after tomorrow, and I'll bat for Mr. Parker. Did you think I was going to let him get away with it? What about next year, I asked. I'm going back to the athletics, he said, and I'm going to hire somebody to call me horseshoes before every game because I can sure play that old baseball when I'm mad. End of Chapter 10, Horseshoes, Part 2 End of How to Write Short Stories with Examples by Ring Lardner.